Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some literary. This is called A Veteran's Oral History Not Recorded. Ready? Here we go. Besides his family, my dad is most proud of his service to his country. He served in the Navy during World War II on the USS Vicksburg as a gunner. When the Japanese signed the instrument of surrender aboard the USS Missouri on September 2, 1945, my dad was able to witness it, though from a distance from the USS Vicksburg, one of many ships in Tokyo Bay that historic day. My siblings and I registered our dad to be included in the National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. Along with a donation, we submitted his name, a picture of him in uniform, and a short description of his service. We took a family trip soon after the memorial opened in 2004, and he was so proud to punch his name into the on-site registry. Tony, T.D. Moy, and see his bio appear. He walked slowly around the whole memorial, taking in all its grandeur. He read every inscription on every column, every brick, finding particular satisfaction with the Pacific Pavilion, a monument dedicated to those who served in the Pacific Arena, as he did. He was hoping that maybe he'd run into a fellow shipmate, but that did not happen. He was so grateful that he was able to experience the memorial firsthand. We took many pictures. It was a trip to remember. With all this in mind, I thought it would be a fitting tribute to record his story for NCRA's Veterans History Project. I went to visit him with my list of questions. My intent was to ask him the questions before we actually went on the record at a later date. I thought this would give him time to formulate his answers and refresh his memory, seeing that the war had ended decades ago. I was amazed at his recall. He remembered lying about his weight so he could enlist. He was underweight then, not so much now. He remembered boot camp, the food, the fun times, on leave, the ship, the endless nights, keeping watch, always at the ready for any trouble. He had yellowed news clippings, pictures, his ID, and letters thanking him for his service from the president and other dignitaries. Things were going well until the saddest memories started to take focus. He remembered his buddies and some who made the ultimate sacrifice. Tears welled up in his eyes. Memories, 70 years old, came flooding back like it was yesterday. Mom and I were shocked at this very rare show of emotion. He could not continue. Dad, like so many of his era, had never spoken about the war before my attempt to interview him, and he hasn't spoken of it since. I could not bear to put him through it. He had suffered enough. He had survived and was living a happy life, thankful for all the blessings that have been bestowed upon him since his time in the service, most notably his marriage, 65 years now, to his dear wife, Josephine, and his six grandchildren. Dad, now 93, delights in wearing his glory hat on outings to restaurants, the grocery store, or doctor's appointments. It is one of his prized possessions. It is emblazoned on the front with the words National World War II Memorial. It gives him great pleasure when a complete stranger notices the hat, shakes his hand, and thanks him for his service, or when a stranger notices his hat and patiently steps aside to hold the door for him. The letters he receives from school children around Memorial Day give him so much joy. Sweet gestures also appreciated. Dad returns the favor whenever he sees a veteran, a veteran of any war. Although sometimes a bout of shyness overcomes him, he still manages to approach and inquire, Are you a vet? If the answer is yes, they exchange brief histories before he offers the vet one of the hundreds of faded blue stars he and Mom have personally cut out from retired flags. The star is accompanied by a saying that reads, I... I'm a part of our American flag. I have flown over a home in the USA. I can no longer fly. The sun and winds have caused me to become tattered and torn. Please carry me as a reminder that you are not forgotten. He always has a star or two in his pocket in case he runs into a fellow patriot. The war shaped dad in so many ways. He experienced so much pain in such a short time, a lifetime ago. He is against all war. He dislikes politicians who have no personal experience on the battlefield who rush to send our nation's treasures into harm's way. War is not the answer. I wanted my dad's personal history to be recorded 
but it is not to be, and that's okay. He served with honor, and that is enough. He will be forever linked to the greatest generation, and it doesn't get better than that. All right, let's try this literary. Ready? Here we go. Ford's smallest SUV has evolved into something quite different from the upright boxy vehicle that first came on the scene in 2001. The fluid lines of the current generation introduced in 2013 are thoroughly modern. As for 2017, the Escape gets further updating with a new grill and an interior redesign. Even more significant are two new EcoBoost engines. Well, maybe not so much. The 1.5 liter mill tested is nothing special. Leisurely acceleration might be forgiven in exchange for super good fuel economy, but a combined EPA score of 24 miles per gallon isn't impressive. The Escape deserves better engine performance. The operational optional 2.0 liter engine better suits its sporty demeanor. Accurate steering and a taut suspension invite drivers to tackle twisty roads. Surprisingly, a 1.5 liter Escape is tow rated for a reasonably hefty 2,000 pounds. The 2.0 liter 3,500 pounds. The Escape's cabin is a pleasant place with low noise levels, though the decor is a mix of upscale piano black trim and chintzy hard plastic materials. Good news for 2017 Ford ditched the cranky My Ford touch system for an easy to use Sync 3 system that supports Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. The Escape's suggested retail prices are on the high side, but hefty and Incentives as high as $5,500 earlier this year make Ford's small SUV an enticing value. All right, let's try some jury charge practice. <clears throat> Here we go. An expert witness is a witness who has special knowledge or experience that allows the witness to testify about matters within his or her expertise and to give an opinion about the issues in the case based on his or her knowledge and experience. You should evaluate the testimony of an expert witness with the same care that you employ in evaluating the testimony of any other witness. You may accept or reject testimony of an expert witness as you judge is appropriate. In weighing expert testimony, you should consider the factors that generally bear upon the credibility of witnesses as well as the particular expert's qualifications, such as education and experience, the soundness of the reasons given for any opinion, and any other evidence in the case that you consider pertinent. Remember that you alone decide how much of a witness's testimony to believe and how much weight it should be given. You have heard the testimony of a number of law enforcement officials. The fact that a witness may be employed as a law enforcement official does not mean that his or her testimony is deserving of either more or less consideration or greater or less weight than any other witness. It is legitimate for defense counsel to question the credibility or reliability of a law enforcement witness on the ground that his or her testimony may be colored by personal or professional interest in the outcome of the case. As with any witness, it is up to you after considering the matter whether to accept and rely on the testimony or of a law enforcement witness just as with any other witness. Consider the evidence as a whole. You ought to consider the evidence from each witness, not only by itself in isolation, as if that witness were the only witness to testify, but also in the context of all the other evidence you have heard. For example, there might be a piece of evidence about which you were originally skeptical, and then you might hear other evidence that leads you to re-examine your initial impression and you being to trust the questioned evidence a bit more. The opposite might happen, of course. You might tend to accept something that sounds pretty good at first, 
then you consider other pieces of evidence. You might begin to doubt what you had first accepted. So again, think of the evidence sensibly as a whole as you make sound judgments about it. You may make inferences from the evidence. An inference is simply a conclusion that you might draw from the available information that you have found to be reliable. You will recall I illustrated this point in my instructions at the end of the first phase of the trial by pointing out that you could draw an inference about how hot a stove burner is from the observation of steam coming out of the tea kettle on the burner. You must be careful that any inferences that you draw are those that you are truly supported by the information you are relying on to make the inference. An inference and consequently proof of a fact by circumstantial evidence cannot be an excuse for guessing or speculating if there are alternate possible inferences from the evidence. You can't just pick one you happen to like. You have to be persuaded by any inference that you make is superior to other possible inferences based on the same evidence and information. And of course, to the extent that you rely in a criminal case on an inference by circumstantial evidence, in the end, any conclusions accepting the government's propositions must be those that convince you beyond a reasonable doubt. Finally, I remind you that you will have the notes that you have taken in both phases of the trial. As before, do not assume that simply because something appears in somebody's notes, it necessarily took place in the courtroom. Instead, it is your collective memory with respect to the information that evidence presented that must control. As I have previously instructed you, a defendant has a constitutional right not to testify. There may be many reasons why a defendant would choose to invoke and exercise that right. You may not, under any circumstances, draw any inference or presumption against a defendant from his decision to invoke that right and to decline to testify accordingly. It should not be considered by you in any way or even discussed in arriving at any aspect of your sentencing decision, including the existence or non-existence of an alleged aggravating or mitigating factor. You must deliberate and determine the appropriate sentence for each of the capital counts individually. Although I will be discussing the capital counts as a group, your findings as to Mr. Sar's age, the gateway factors, aggravating factors, and all the other issues pertaining to those counts must address each of the counts individually. It is possible that although there may be parallels or connections between some counts, you may also find differences that would justify different sentences on different counts. You should understand, however, that if you impose the death penalty as to any count or counts, the death sentence will control regardless of any life sentence or sentence that might be sentences that might be imposed on other counts. As you know, there are 17 counts concerning a total of four homicides. You should not attach any significance to the fact that these four homicides have given rise to more than four capital counts. The government is entitled to bring multiple charges with respect to each homicide, but the number of counts does not by itself mean that the defendant's conduct is more blameworthy or that he is deserving of greater punishment. The instructions that I am going to give you, as well as the verdict form that you will be completing, will address first, will address your findings, if any, with respect to the defendant's age at the time of the offenses, the four so-called gateway factors, and the statutory aggravating factors identified by the government with respect to each capital count. The instructions on the verdict form thereafter address your findings, if any, as to each capital count regarding the existence of any non-statutory aggravating factors and mitigating factors, as well as the weighing of aggravating and mitigating factors. So let me now discuss with you in summary form first the steps that you must follow in considering the issues before you as to each capital offense. I will then discuss in greater detail each of these steps. First, you will consider whether the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt and to your unanimous satisfaction that the defendant was at least 18 years old at the time of the capital offenses for which you have found him guilty. Second, you will consider as appropriate whether the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt and to your unanimous satisfaction one or more threshold intent factors or gateway factors established by Congress as to each of the capital offenses for which you have found the defendant was at least 18 years old at the time of the capital offense. Third, you will consider as appropriate whether the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt and to your unanimous satisfaction at least one statutory aggravating factor alleged as to each of the capital offenses for which you have found the defendant was at least 18 years of age at the time of the capital offense and have found the existence of at least one gateway factor. 
Fourth, you will consider as appropriate whether any non-statutory aggravating factors identified by the government have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt and to your unanimous satisfaction as to each of the capital offenses for which you have found the defendant was at least 18 years of age at the time of the offense and have also found the existence of at least one gateway factor and the existence of at least one statutory aggravating factor. Fifth, you will consider as appropriate whether any of you individually or together with the other jurors find that the defendant has proved by a preponderance of the evidence any mitigating factor or factors. Sixth, if you have found the defendant was at least 18 years of age at the time of the particular offense under consideration and at least one gateway factor and at least one statutory aggravating factor, you must then weigh the aggravating factors, statutory and non-statutory, that you have all found to exist and any mitigating factors that you personally have found to exist to determine the appropriate sentence. You must decide in regard to that particular capital offense whether the aggravating factors that have been found to exist sufficiently outweigh the mitigating factors found to exist for that offense as to justify imposing a sentence of death on the defendant for that offense or if you do not find any mitigating factors whether the aggravating factors alone are sufficient to justify imposing a sentence of death on the defendant for that offense. Now let me give you some greater detail. Excuse me, I'm fighting a summer cold here. A bad time. Before you may consider the imposition of the death penalty, you must first all agree beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Saar was 18 years of age or older at the time of the offense. I'm going to to put on your monitors because you're going to display for you the verdict slip that you will be filling out because I think it may help you to track these instructions as I go through them. So in the event that all find beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Czar was 18 years of age or older at the time of the offenses as to all counts, you are to indicate that finding on the appropriate line in section one of the verdict form. And you'll see that's the top line, the first one of the three. In the event that you all find beyond a reasonable doubt that he was 18 years of age or older at the time of the offenses as to some of the counts, but not others here to, to indicate that finding on the appropriate line in section one of the verdict form and also identify on the line provided by count number those specific counts as to which you find that he was at least 18 and that you will see is the third option. Just some literary material. Ready? Here we go. Buick may call its little Encore an SUV, but it has more in common with a station wagon or hatchback than a rugged sport utility vehicle. The Encore supplies some of the niceties of an SUV, a relatively high seating position for good forward visibility and versatile cargo space, but it will never see rock crawling duty in the boonies, especially in the as-tested four-wheel drive version, nor is it rated to tow a trailer. That said, the Encore is a dandy urban runabout. It is easy to maneuver around a crowd crowded parking lot or through city traffic. Light steering contributes to the Encore's agility, and the suspension delivers a compliant ride. The sport touring model, equipped with a more powerful engine, provides zippy acceleration despite the Encore's small footprint footprint, its big foot size and cargo carrying ability, folding down the front passenger seat and rear seat allows an 8 foot long by 2 by 4 to fit inside with the tailgate shut. However, shoulder room both front and back is a little tight. The Encore made its debut for model year 2013 and is a corporate cousin to the Chevy Trax. The 2017 edition received receives minor exterior and interior styling updates plus the addition of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto befitting a Buick. The Encore is generously equipped including standard active noise cancellation technology, a 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot and Bluetooth. In sum, it's understandable why the Encore has become one of Buick's biggest sellers. Jeep offers a dizzying number of various variations on the Cherokee theme. 
The sticker price can range from as little as the mid 20,000s for a four cylinder four wheel drive sport model to as much as the mid 40,000s for an option laden V6 four wheel drive overland edition although generous incentives typically are available in all models the performance of the bargain basement sport isn't exactly scintillating its four banger makes modest horsepower and wants a jeep without four-wheel drive on the other hand the tailhawk edition is the genuine article of vehicle equipped to scamper over most any terrain a good compromise for all-around use is the model reviewed here a four-wheel drive latitude with the optional v6 the Cherokee uses a unibody platform it shares with a couple of discounted sedans, the Chrysler, Chrysler 200 and Dodge Dart. Handling is car-like with a comfy ride, though the steering is numb. The V6 is fairly refined, quiet, and provides plenty of acceleration, and the 9-speed, yes, 9, automatic shifts are smoother than they were when the Cherokee first appeared as a 2014 model. The aft seat is roomy, and the Uconnect system is easy to use. Finally, a V6 Cherokee is tow rated for 4,500 pounds, outstanding in its class. Choose the model and options wisely, and the Cherokee is a capable SUV at a reasonable price. All right, well, it looks like we can stop there. That will conclude our literary injury charge practice.